Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, can you hear me OK? Uh, my name is Tom Weaver. And um, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Jason Griffiths. Uh, Jason is an associate professor of architecture um, at Arizona State University. And he's also um, a founding partner with his wife, Alex, of Gino Griffiths Architects, um, building a number of projects in, south, in the American Southwest. Um, but more pertinently for tonight's um, talk, he's also the author of this terrific book that the A has just published, uh, Manifest Destiny. Um, it's a book that basically um, divided into 59 chapters. It's a book that charts um, a kind of road trip around the American Southwest that Jason made with Alex, documenting recent developments in American suburban housing. Um, drawing on a kind of multitude of different sources, it is also kind of in many ways a kind of bastard child of a sort of rather peculiar menage a trois between Christopher Alexander's A Pattern Language, um, Umberto Eco's Travels in Hyperreality, and Jack Kerouac's On the Road. But its, but it's kind of parentage could also be traced to um, um, other books like uh, Raina Bannum's uh, Scenes in American Deserter and the photographs of um, Hilla Besher, um, William Eggleston, and Walker Evans. But, um, but much, as you'll see when you, uh, when you get the book, much more than the images, the really original thing about uh, Jason's book and his research as an architectural critic is the way in which he writes. Um, Jason has kind of basically cast off 150 years of architectural writing and adopted a kind of guise that is fundamentally sort of succinct, um, aphoristic, and consistently deadpan. Um, and immediately after this lecture, the doors of the space just down the corridor here are going to fling open, and you can have the opportunity to buy this book at a reduced price, uh, surrounded by the inducements of wine, beer, and snacks. Um, but before then, here's the man himself, Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, there's already a, a number of references that I don't know about emerging, uh, so I'm already on a back foot right from, right from the beginning. Uh, thanks to the AA, thanks to Tom, thanks to Brett Steele, a everyone at AA Publications for pulling this thing together. I'm delighted with the way that it's come out, and that's in large part due to, to Tom and his crew. Uh, what Tom forgot to mention is that we've won an award for that, the Deutsche Architecture Museum, um, and it's known as the DAM Award. Uh, which, tr which goes down well in the States. We've got that goddamn, got that damn award. So um, here it is, uh, Manifest Destiny, titled, uh, it's in orange cover, as you can see. Subtitle is, uh, the, A Guide to the Essential Indifference of American Suburban Housing. Um, one would think from the smart European uh, publishing house that would segue or fold neatly into an some kind of acronym. Um, we didn't think about that, but that acronym turns out to be uh, AGIASH. So if you want to abbreviate it, there it is. Um, but it also is Geisha as well. So uh, I thought that, that might be um, a, a useful way of, kind of abbreviating what is a bit of a tongue twister of a title. There. The Manifest Destiny, <coughs> the, ty the term um, originally coined by somebody called John Sullivan, writing for the Democratic Review in 1940, um, describes the then conceived, the conceived sort of divine mandate for westward expansion within the United States. Um, John Sullivan was trying to persuade uh, the American people to elect Polk at that time. Democrats were then looking to annex Texas um, and that was, uh, that was the umbrella, the kind of political umbrella in which John O'Sullivan first made that term. Something that was described as a kind of Hegelian uh, notion uh, that it was right and proper that, that um, America should be populated by settlers moving from the East, the divine mandate, the creation of a myth and a desire for new, for new land. Um, John Gast, with really one of his only paintings, paints Manifest Destiny. And Destiny is the angel floating the Bible in her hand, leading people to 
leading people westwards. The frontiersmen to the left-hand side, even Native American Indians. And to the right-hand side, you have the kind of emerging industrial, industrial nation coming from, coming from the east by John Gerst. Um, all leading the way to this sort of Arcadian, Arcadian dream, really. And we'll talk a little bit about that as the setting for the American suburbs. That ideal of a home in the country. Yeah. I spent about eight years or nine years working on this, working on this book, on and off. In fact, I'd spent a long time not working on it until, with thanks to Ed Jess and Tom Weaver, um, we picked it up and we worked on it. In, really in 2002. Um, but up until that point, in the time that I'd spent traveling in the US, I'd become increasingly aware of a, some kind of sense of, um, well, my observation really was uh, that the suburbs, the American suburb, has a strange kind of ambivalence to it. That almost perfect, when Robert Venturi describes suburbia as being almost perfect, I'm trying to flip that phrase a little bit, so it's almost, almost perfect an imperceptible, barely perceptible absence in a place that's so uh, apparently complete. <coughs> Francis Yates, uh, Francis Yates, Richard Yates, I beg your pardon, I don't think they were related, uh, in Revolutionary Road, um, made into a film, says this at one point, it's one of my favorite quotes, uh, um, goes like this, the sofa was there, the big table was there, but they might have just as well been reversed. There was a wall of books obediently competing for dominance with the picture window, but it might well have been a lending library. Other pieces of furniture had indeed removed the suggestion of primness, but they had failed to replace it with any other quality. The chairs, the coffee table, the floor lamp, and the desk all stood like items arbitrarily arranged for an auction. It's that sense of the incongruity of the manufactured home of manufactured traditions that comes to the core. And that's probably best described, I mean, you can describe it in many ways of that sort of ambiguity, but it's a, a division, let's say, or, or ambiguity between the ideal, and an ideal is it expressed in the ideal <coughs> of the front door, and what it symbolizes, you know, where you place the wreath and Thanksgiving, Christmas, and family photographs are taken, and then the real entrance to the building, which is the garage. Something like 65% Americans enter their houses through, through the garage, richly, and the front door is a bit barely used. I want to use that just as one example that would sort of set the tone for different kind of nuances of ambiguity, which I'm interested in, in exploring here. So 2002, Alex Gino and I set out on, um, let's say, a somewhat belated version of that movement west, of westward movement. Um, following some strange, screwed-up version of, uh, of Manifest Destiny. I don't know what, who she is today, um, but something leading us from east to west, on a rough trajectory from east to west. And this was our route here. And we started in 2002, you know, our quest. And we were on a quest. We were on a quest for truth and rightness and cleanliness and well-meaningness and other things that end in ness. Uh, and this was our route, 30,000 miles uh, around North, uh, North America. And we were funding ourselves by lecturing in universities. But in the meantime, we would go to the periphery of the city. And we would drive around and drive around in a kind of uh, systematic way. One city block, ritualistically driving, very dr slowly driving every road within that block, and then photographing what we saw. Um, it's kind of an odyssey, if you like. Um, I have to say that in 2002, hopefully, I don't know whether David Green or Kate Heron are here, but if, but if they're not, they should be here in spirit. Um, 2002, I told Kate Heron, who's running the uh, architecture department at the University of Westminster, where I was teaching that time. They planned to sort of jack my job in, flat, and I was going to go and hit the road. And she was openly very supportive, or apparently very supportive. Um, uh, I think secretly both she and David were planning an intervention of some sort, you know. Uh, I feel, looking at some of friends and people <laughs> tonight here, it feels like the second attempt at maybe that intervention. Are you sure you want to do that? You know, you're going to throw it all in and hit the road. Um, but we went. Um, 
So being obsessive really about, about the associations that we, we wanted to conjure in this, in this uh, journey, I thought we had to have the right car. And we looked around for a long time and we got ourselves a, a 1988 GMC Suburban. And there it is. So that beloved vehicle took us 30,000 miles around, around North America. Um, and we had an exhibition in the back, an exhibition of work which was showing at universities. Um, at one point, we had a, this sounds like sort of, you know, this typical kind of odyssey, the road trip story, but we were outside Las Vegas. It's a Hunter S. Thompson thing, isn't it? You know, we're, out, we're in Basto outside Vegas, 50 miles outside Vegas. We were trying to, we were, we were, we were driving to Las Vegas where we had an exhibition and it was a make or break thing because they were paying us a good amount of money, uh, something like $2,000 to give a lecture and put on an exhibition there. And it was important for us. Um, and we had to go over Hoover Dam. This is 9-11. Okay, so this thing happens. All right, so we're pulled over by a state trooper. And they, they obviously get the most polite and genial ones in the most touristic areas, you know. And they asked us what we were doing with a truck full of boxes. We've got an exhibition. We're architects. We're going to put it on at, you know, in Las Vegas. You know, a truck full of boxes. We're not quite happy with that. So this transpired into, after a bit of negotiation. We got the whole exhibition out mounted the whole thing up, models, everything on the dusty side of the road, and they gave us the full shakedown, you know, the full review, right? So I've been in some tough reviews in my time before, you know, I've had, I've had difficult reviews, thanks to people like Jonathan Hill in the audience here, former, former tutor, um, others, you know, I, nothing's ever been this tough, nothing's ever been this tough. And they let me go with a very, very skeptical opinion. They were, we don't, and I had to explain what a plan was. You know, it's a plan like you're looking from above and you're looking down and the buildings are laid out. They weren't buying it at all, you know. But they let us go. One of many, many road si moments in roadside America, um, what we call a borderline pass, you know. Uh, this led us eventually in, so in 2007, Tom and I, and thanks say to Ed, uh, Claire McManus, uh, Sophie Carter as well, a publications. We, we, we started thinking about publishing the photographs that we, we'd been taking en route. And Tom sort of hinted at that notion of a kind of a, a pattern book. And this is how we, how we eventually went at it. A very kind of staccato structure whereby you have a photograph that would describe whatever these nuances of ambiguity are, and then some text that hopefully illuminates it in some, some way. And this is the structure of the book. And we worked this structure out through a, the A files, and after that, it was really a matter of, of, of doing it, along with an introduction and a very, very um, kind afterward by Martino Stierli as well. So I'm indebted to all, all those, those people. Of course, the suburbs, you know, it's not an American invention by any stretch of the imagination. It's argued, Robert Frischman would argue that the suburbs began in Clapham. And this is William Wilberforce, you know, as part of the evangelical movement to move people, move, particularly to move women out of the city uh, and set up Clapham Common, set in Clapham Common, uh, and to remove them, from, as I say, from the ills of the city um, in a place where they could practice the delicate arts, I think is the term that, term that he uses. Um, of course, in transitioning to America, the Arcadian vision changed slightly. 1980s, there two, two Russian painters set out to paint the perfect American painting, Kormer and Melamin. Um, and they painted a painting which is called America's Most Wanted. And they know that it's the most wanted because they conducted an internet survey of 1,001 Americans from the Nation Institute to say, what is it that's, that you want in the ideal painting of, of America? What best describes it? So, by, by science has proven that that is the best painting, uh, the, the most popular painting in, in the U.S. You have a landscape, obviously a hills in the background, a lake. Thomas Jefferson has to be there, some deer there, and I don't know. I'm, that bit I'm not sure about. They look like some college grads going off to do something in the corner. I'm not quite sure what that is. I don't know how that got kind of voted in. But it's into that landscape that the suburbs arrive, right? Into this bucolic scene that the, the suburbs arrive. And of course, that arrival is signified by the signifier for me and the enduring kind of image of the American suburb is that, is that picture of a house or a cabin in a clearing in a wilderness. 
house in a clearing. The first house. Suburban structures occasionally call to mind their roots in the frontier experience. A pioneering spirit crystallized in the image of a small house standing at the edge of a vast and savage landscape. Confronting the wilderness, this cabin provides a place of refuge for the men and women who work the land in advance of the settlement yet to come, the first house. Today, the legacy of the pioneer's cabin can be encountered at the fringes of suburbia. Like a portent, the vast expanses of housing that will follow in its wake. In true pioneering fashion, the structure shown here lays claim to the landscape simply by virtue of being there first. The homespun element of the pitched roof and the white timber siding, fetishistically pristine against the churned soil of the building site, is the formal embodiment of the myth of manifest destiny, a symbol of enterprise, resourcefulness, and the ultimate triumph in the face of an unknown and threatening world. Like Abbe Loggia's own primitive hut, that's both natural and affected, this cabin stands as the proud primogenitor of suburbia. A secured outlook We're in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed about, I, I, I really didn't see the alien kind of, you know. Uh, you know. Uh, so this security booth stands at the entrance of a condominium in Phoenix, Arizona. A pane of seamless black glass divides the building, severing the base from the heavy cornice above. Reminiscent of the tinted windows of the passing SUV, this glass contrasts sharply with the brick and tile of the domestic environment. Moreover, the absence of mullions or any form of vertical connection ensures that the panoramic view from within remains unobscured. Only the Palo Verde tree, whose twin trunks bisect the elevation, appears to be tolerated because it doesn't interfere with the oblique views of cars approaching and leaving the development. Nothing else is allowed to interrupt the view or indeed the uncompromising approach towards residential security declared by this glazed wall. The black glass serves a dual function, protecting the booth's occupants from the harsh desert sunlight and providing a one-way screen through which to observe people entering the development. Approaching the booth on foot, which is completely almost illegal in Arizona, very unusual, it becomes apparent that the interior contains nothing except a small strip of carpet and some disconnected cables. The camera and the entry phone on the side only seem to affirm its hidden redundancy. Today, residents act as their own security guards. The black glass panopticon, meanwhile, serves up a forbidding and yet ultimately empty gesture. A sphinx-like monolith of dark austerity set before a bed of cheerful geraniums. Next one is what we call the same building. I beg your pardon, it's called the concluding balustrade. At 11 inches, this is 11, 11 inches, this is the shortest balustrade I've ever encountered in my entire life, protruding exactly 11 inches from, from that wall here. But it does its best to come to a kind of a hasty conclusion that the balustrade on the left has gone to a considerably more effort to, to bring, a, bring across a kind of sense of grandeur to this staircase. This staircase is a, is a code compliant width staircase, but it aspires to be a Scala Regia type staircase, a grand staircase, right? Because it opens onto a triple height, a triple height space, right? Uh, we thought about calling this one half grand, just half grand, because this is the opening that, that it leads onto here. So it's a grand opening, but it's compromised, it's, it's, it's uh, shrunken the X coordinate here. So, you know, you feel for the, uh, you feel for the, uh, the balustrade on the left. It makes, a, it makes a lot of effort to come all the way down the staircase here and elbows neatly into the newel post at the end, which is the conclusion that the one here has quickly come to in the same, same, same amount of time. It's essentially there, of course, like so many things in suburbia, as an afterthought, a way of kind of trying to conclude or trying to, try to summarize things within the garb of... of, 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 of of suburbia, of the bucolic or the, or the domestic. Um, and this is another example of what I mean by this kind of ambiguity that seems to flow through, through suburbia, this, this kind of duality, this kind of tension, tension between an ideal and something practical. It's practical because you have to, be, you have, to have a balustrade at the bottom of the staircase, two, two stairs at the bottom, 
bottom to meet code. So there it is. And there's the thing. Faux finishes. One of, I think in the, in, the, in the US, I think one of the most abused terms for realtors is, is loft living, you know. Um, if you think about the kind of Dutch hippies in the 1970s living in freezing cold, you know, as pioneers of a kind of a realtors, you know, a, a, a kind of movement within real estate, you know, we have in Miami, you have whole tower blocks which are lofts. They're all lofts. I find it hard to understand how everything can be a loft in a building. But, th but there it is, you know, and it goes to New York and people are still freezing and they're artists and they've only got bare brick, you know. Uh, but somehow it gets uh, assimilated, aestheticized, until we get to Las Vegas, okay, where, we, where we find um, uh, some loft apartments, duplexes here. The wallpaper, which is kind of expensive, is vinyl with a photographic image of brick on it. And the brick has been taken, is, this is taken from a loft. I'd like to know what loft it was photographed from here, of course, but not to, not to um, uh, miss the opportunity or to keep the ruse going, of course, they uh, paper, over the, paper over the socket here and attempt to keep that. Um, what they call, what they're called brick sniffers. Uh, this, it's people who move into an apartment, they strip all the plaster back and sniff the brick because it has value, um, and then it absorbs a vast amount of water and they have to repaint it. Anyway, it doesn't happen here because this is vinyl and you can wipe this down and you get the brick effect here. Of course, that's a one-off, really. Uh, you know, this, this, is this really a vernacular? You know, it's a one-off, right? So we head off to, to Houston here and the uh, interior of a room in a, in a David Weekly home uh, and really quite an extraordinary house, like 4,000 square foot Mac Mansion that contains mini apartments for the, for the, for the children. So the children will have a room, a, a kind of like a guest room, a playroom, an ensuite bathroom, you know, uh, within this house. It's kind of like a sh frat house of some sort. Anyway, one of these rooms was decorated in the Waikiki style, uh, the, with, with the, uh, using this spirited torn paper effect. You know, and, and like the brick, the torn paper uh, carries on regardless. The same building. Suburban buildings in their penultimate stages of construction share a curiously common trait. This building, part of a grand estate on a, 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 a grand estate on a five-acre lot is developed by a custom home builder in the Cave Creek region of Phoenix. And it derives its mute appearance from the fact that almost every exterior surface is clad in orientated strand board, OSB, <clears throat> including the roof, the chimney stack, the eaves, the windows, and the arches. At this stage, the building is in its most homogenous state, ex exposing the fundamental, um, fundamental material ubiquity that subjects all its surfaces to an indiscriminately reductive treatment. These familial forms <coughs> seemed cast in a hesitant approximation of the architecture that they will one day become. At once familiar and foreign, this temporary blankness reveals the underlying clothes horse of most suburban buildings and reduces the house-like silhouette to a dematerialized simplicity. The majority of buildings in this region and of this period will look like this for a brief moment in their lives. OSB affiliates all new buildings, regardless of their standing within the suburban pecking order. This house will shortly separate itself from the crowd and achieve a lofty status through the application of finishes and decoration. But for a short while, it must endure the humbling exposure of its OSB-clad conformity. And we put another one in. So this is... Um, it's not the truth to materials that interests me in this. It's not the kind of, un there's an underlying rationale to all suburban houses, almost all I say. We go to Florida and you have to, you have to build in cinder block because of, because of legislation uh, after Hurricane Andrew. Ev almost everywhere else in the United States, everything, everything is stud construction and eight by four sheet sheeting and then it's clad over in whatever the style, whatever the style is. But it's not that kind of, it's not a kind of underlying kind of morality that interests me. It's the, it's the sense that everything gets treated in, within the same material. This kind of indiscriminate, obsessive use of, of one, one surface. Um, it has a quiet, for me, the, you know, what I, what's interesting about this for me, and I maybe I'll talk about it in a bit, is it has a quasi kind of computational feel to me as well. It's as if it's like a built rendering, you know, with a very bad material application, let's say. 
and somehow collage into that site. It has this, it has this strangely, uh, strange otherworldliness that belongs to the computer for me in a, in a way. Of course, not to be outdone by that, right next to it, we have a building um, that, that uh, uses OSB in another way or it does something to the scale of the building. We call this the full scale model. So another OSB had clad house under construction has this intriguing way of changing the building's scale. This photograph shows a development which appears reduced in its elemental purity of an architectural model. The unfinished OSB sheathing um, and the archetypal form it describes evokes the quality it recall Aldo Rossi's Teatro del Mundo or the modern or the wooden walls of the Palladian villas. If you think of Villa Barbaro in particular from the recent exhibition. Right. The observer may be struck in the first instance by the timber-clad abstract typologies, and in the second, by the balance of classical forms, two precedents which appear to have been combined to produce a building which looks like a full-scale model here. There is, however, a ruinous aspect to this building that both adds and complicates these references. The windowless sockets convey an evacuated property, while the sloppy overpainting of the black eaves suggests a recent fire. The advantage of seeing a building in this state is that it creates a more compelling interpretation of these architectural precedents. While most suburban buildings tend to normalize historical precedents, this building offers a new perspective in the form of an abandoned toy-like version of a past architecture. So I'm looking at this and the whole time I'm thinking, you know, this is a sort of a strangely reduced uh, kind, of, kind of dark version of antiquity here perfect in its current form, in, in, in my view. It's like a sort of, it's, it's a bit like a Michael Graves, uh, uh, you know, the backward half-brother of Michael Graves, perhaps. <laughs> Debate. <laughs> um, a model of construction. William Garnett, you know, photographing, I mean, William Garnett was commissioned to photograph uh, lakeside and houses that were going up because it was a celebration of the post-war stud construction, uh, de-skilled, building methodology, you know. Uh, he didn't realize he was creating artistic photographs at that time, but William Garnett has become to, come to, come to sort of signify that industrialization of, 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 the, of, of the building process. What I enjoy so much about going to some of these suburban, suburban developments is the chance to see these buildings in their incomplete state. And quite often, when you're there, you can look down a row of houses, right, and you can see it's almost like one of those gropius diagrams of how to build a building. So you start with the bare site at one end and you end up with a finished house at the other. And it's a drawing kind of incarnate. What happens is that the, 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 the sequencing is designed to work spatially down the road so that you'll have, everything gets graded to start with. And then you'll have people doing the casting a slab at one end and then a, a team of, of, of Mexican house cleaners at the other kind of preparing the final, the final finished house. And then the house in every phase of, con of its construction in between and nowhere else do you really see something like this, something so, so pure, in a sense, so, so pure in kind of construction terms, and so evocative or so uh, diagrammatic, like a built diagram of, this, of, the, of, of how to build a suburban house. And you can get it in the suburbs because they're building on unobstructed, unobstructed land, right? Every suburban lot almost is on virgin land. They scrape it clean, they start building. And the rationalization of that process is, is overtly... Uh, overtly apparent there. Again, it has almost this computational feel to it, like a, like a, like a manual as to how to build, build a house. We call it true modern. And again, you know, I mean, this is one of, the, one, one of the... There is this truly modern process that lies beneath suburbia. I mean, it's like... It's as, as if... Um, you know, there's a whole kind of feeling within suburbia, well, certainly within academia in America, that... that um, the Bauhaus elementarists are going to come back one day, you know. But right now, there is a, they're having a big frump, you know. They've been having it for quite a long time because the industrial process that they set in, set in motion, you know, in the 1930s, has been co-opted by the, by the suburbs. It is, it is a, a supreme achievement of industrial, of industrial building techniques. And so this modernity, this sort of sneaky modernity, lies, lies, beneath, these, lies beneath these buildings. Craftsman's Interior, another something historical reference. Uh, 
just going to pause and take a drink. I have taken a drink, and now I will carry on. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, for a brief period, Californian suburban design was influenced by the craftsman style, the name to which the American arts and crafts movement became known. With notable examples like the Gamble and the Schindler House seeking to synthesize the work of the timber craftsman Japanese influences, this approach set in, uh, was set in opposition to the industrial forms of construction, producing a series of houses which established a new model for suburban housing, one which was ultimately to have scant influence on the evolution of contemporary suburbia. The present-day suburban home stands as the antithesis to the arts and crafts ideal. Its unfinished stud walls offering a stark reminder of the traditional craftsmanship of timber and that has been, re been discarded in favor of de-skilled de de construction and mass-produced housing. Despite this, the stud work photographed here has an unusually harmonious composition which would require only minor alterations to make it resemble the in an interior of a different origin. The central stud could be moved a little to the right. The three vertical clusters of four king studs could be reduced to three. Adding another stud to the left, far left, would then balance the symmetry, completing the illusion of a wood-finished interior drenched in the diffuse light of the craftsman-style house. It's always diffuse light. And here that diffuse light is achieved by the aid of temporary plastic window protection. Although fabricated using fast-track construction techniques, this interior momentarily invokes a tradition that once attempted to influence early suburban design. And like that tradition, it's soon to be concealed by mass production's implacable process. So you know, photographing, we've photographed a lot of buildings in their incomplete state. I sp I've spent hours and hours and hours on construction sites. And I have to say, uh, they are the cleanest construction sites I've ever seen. I, that, that's one thing, and you've got to respect that. You know? um, and they allow you to photograph them in this way that it takes very, very little alteration to get this almost... This is really, this is really a Japanese interior here, the diffuse light coming in and around it. And it's kind of perfect. You know, it's kind of perfect. And so below this, the kind of the rational process of stud construction sort of unwittingly reveals this thing. And then, and then it's hidden within, within the next you know, three days or something. The time I've spent in and around the, in and around, walking in and around incomplete buildings has been very evocative in that sense. Similarly, with kind of a notion of a stud forest here in Plano, Texas. I'll take you back to Plano sometime later. But the stud construction is, you know, its, it's, it's, it's spiritual home is the forest, you know, is forestry. And now, you know, it used to be in the northern states, but now it's in places like Alabama and the Midwest. And what happens is there's a, there's a sort of poetic terminology to the way in which a tree becomes a stud, you know, it's, it's debarked, it's stacked, it's stickered, it's stuck, it's stuck. You know, all the, the language is very sort of industrial, blue-collar kind of poetic to it. And then it goes through this process, it arrives on the site in neatly stacked bundles of dimensional lumber, and then it's reassembled like this. But then there's this moment here you get where the forest kind of reappears in some way, you know, that, that, uh, but within that forest there's this ephemeral house emerging. And standing inside these, these, these sort of stud constructions, you see rooms and you see forms, but they, they kind of appear and they disappear in front of you, a kind of, a kind of new form of phenomenal transparency, if you like, a, a, a very ephemeral version of suburbia, you know, um, that seems to sort of refer itself right back to, right back to the, the forest, a kind of mechanized uh, forest in becoming a, in becoming a house. I think if you look at Venturi's work in, in, in Vail in Colorado, the ski lodge in Vail, Colorado, with the poplar trees in front, I think it's very synonymous with that. The building is kind of forged into, uh, forged from the forest, but refer, refers to it in some way. De suburban defense. The walls that define the perimeter are generally more robust than the entire suburban development. So primarily constructed uh, and occasionally clad in stone, they lend an additional emphasis to their solidity and durability. So in this photograph in Mesa, two, two of these walls meet at a certain point and marked by stone cladding. And on the other side, there's a cantilevered pier that extends, the, extends upwards to form this castellation. 
So on the other side, there's a 20-foot drop and a stretch of block work that defines, uh, divided the stone piers. From this vantage point, the wall provides a development with the imposing entrance feature that resembles a fortified city wall. Visible in the distance are the types of houses that will soon be built on this site, all of which will be clad in similar robust finishes to compete with the appearance of the entrance wall. Unlike the wall, however, the house will have a basic stud frame and timber roof trusses. Here, as in most suburban developments, it's the perimeter wall that's solid and therefore more permanent than the houses that they encircle. Instead of offering a reassuring sense of permanence, it serves to highlight the relative frailty of the houses that it seeks to protect. The oddly truncated trunk of, chunk of stonework hints at a burgeoning truth about suburbia. The enduring legacy of contemporary US housing is more likely to be the defensive walls that surround them rather than the houses that within. So in, a, in an apocalyptic scenario, let's say, you know, the memory of the suburbs will be one of security as opposed to, you know, that's the durable legacy, the ruin, really. You get that again when you go to places like Plano in Texas, and double walls here. We haven't really seen this before, but this was really an extreme condition of walling here where Plano is a very, is a very Republican, a very religious uh, county north of, north of Dallas. It's a dry county. Dry in many senses, really, certainly in, in terms of humor, but dry in drink terms, more importantly. Uh, you've got to drive out of Plano to get a drink. Anyway, they're, they're clearly uh, concerned about security here because they have two walls that surround the property here. You've got the robust wall made out, of, made out of brick. There's a service alley that runs here. All the trash gets collected. And then they have a picket fence on the inside, right? So that's, this picket fence is really stretching that the, the sense, uh, you know, the Huckleberry Finn or, you know, good fences make good neighbors, you know, that the archetypal, the, 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 the archetype of, of suburban image, the picket fence kind of familiarity. Like, I don't imagine there are guys leaning on this fence discussing lawn mowing methods, you know, like, like this. This is over 10 foot high, cantilevered, has reinforced, and it's got foundations, right, that go all the way, all the way down to the ground. So it extrudes, the, it extrudes the, the, the association in this kind of anamorphic lankiness, if you like. And again, this enduring legacy is, is, is one, of, one of exclusion, a kind of rhetorical exclusion of the, of the double walls, if you like. We call the neutralizing wall and a similar kind of effect that you use two walls, one wall you know, to do all the practical work and then another one to bring you into this scenario to bring you into the, into the landscape, to, to, bring, to, to bring to mind this one version, this is a desert version of that bucolic image of, oh, we've got two images of that one there. In Nebraska, so we're going back to bricks, in the Midwest, many of the Midwestern states, um, code uh, requires that you build basements, you know, and of course the basement is, is, is at, the, at the heart of all um, horror movies, you know, within, within the U.S. Everything horrible comes out of the basement in the Midwest, you know, or it comes out of the corn, you know, sort of pale-looking children with their hair parted like that, with kind of dead eyes, you know. Uh, but this is a basement here, and you're required to build below the frost line. Um, and you use, uh, in order to do it, you use this um, totally awesome shuttering. Yeah, this is aluminum, aluminium, right? Aluminium, aluminum. Totally awesome. Like, it's awesome aluminum shuttering. Uh, and it is awesome, actually. Um, and, it's, and it's used to produce this, this brick stamp, this brick stamp effect here. Uh, what interests me about this, again, that sense of ambiguity between the ideal brick house, you know, and then, and then the cast-in-place concrete is, is where... Um, you know, uh, uh, Louis Kahn kind of appears here, you know, or, or Tado Ando, you know. It, I'd, I'd like to go, I'd like to work with this as a kind of a material and the slightly discordant uh, uh, pattern here, the slight the shift, the slight shift in, in, in the brick. Um, after these houses are built, these, all these walls are left like this, all right? So the people within the Midwest really... Um, have assimilated them into a genuine kind of vernacular now. And they're very beautiful, these walls. And when you see them in long runs, and 
and they're done, they're cast very nicely. They're absolutely comfortable with the, with the, the concrete, the materiality of the concrete, you know, and then the signifier of the brick. Something has moved on, and something has legitimately moved on to produce a, a type of vernacular that's awesome and comes from aluminum. Uh, the ruin in reverse. Again, I was talking a little bit about this. Uh, in, we're in Florida here, and this is the only cases where we saw really solid masonry construction used. You know, I mean, you can find odd buildings that built a block, but in the, for volume building, all of Florida has to have this, uh, this, uh, this cinder block construction. They strap the roofs down to stop the hurricanes blowing it away. So I went back to this building sometime later. Sadly, I don't have a photograph of it. I don't know why, but it, it was very quickly dressed up in, a, in Spanish colonial style um, with all the accoutrements, and nice window frames and, and tiled roof and so on and so forth. And, and looking at it and then reminding, being reminded that Rob, Robert Smithson quote about the ruin, ruin in reverse, you know. And the reason we included this one was because it, you know, at that time, we're starting to think about, well, imagine that this building, this is this building in 200 years' time, right? A kind of edifice, with Louis Kahn saying, every building makes a good ruin. You know, the windows have fallen out. The, this is a long dead lawn, you know. Um, only the roof is kind of really sticking it out. And what I enjoy about this is there is a kind of potential ruinous quality potential ruin, ruinous aesthetic to the suburbs, which could be found in places like Florida, you know, uh, if things keep going the way they are, you know. Um, but that, again, should be its legacy in some way, a genuine style. And I'm not talking about brutalism here, you know, or Claude Parent's bunker archaeology. It's that typology, that familial typology that seems, when you cast it, you render it permanent in concrete, that it gains its, attains its sort of real, real beauty for me. A blind corner. So there's a tradition in American um, pla uh, the planning of the suburbs that you name the street or the road that you develop on after the last indigenous species that you had to kill in order to build the, build the development, right? So there'll be, you know, rattlesnake alley. There'll be no rattlesnakes. Owl swoop, they're all gone. Rabbit run, rabbits are all dead. You know, no such thing. I never came across a name as good as this one, though. This is on Aimless Avenue, all right? They built a sub suburban development on Aimless Avenue. What, what were they thinking? It was Friday. They were tired. They wanted to go. What could they aim? Let's call it Aimless. It seems like a nice name, Aimless Avenue, but so strangely prophetic. So what happens when things are not planned um, and the beautiful kind of mistake that, that results here is, is this. It's, it's a side road that wasn't really considered in the design, the repeat cookie cutter suburban house, because usually it's the house next to it that covers the indifferent handling of the wall. At the back, you do very little in suburban houses. All the money is on the front so that it complies with the homeowners association agreements. You have to make sure that the front of the house is tickety-boo. You can't have a barbecue on there, but it has to look like you could have a barbecue on it. Um, everything has to be special, but the back, you don't need to bother about it. What, so this building has that double misfortune, let's say, that it's no, there's no building next to it here, and that perimeter wall, that permanent wall, has taken a, right, a left-hand turn and finds itself out of sorts, really, entering into, into the suburb. But, so again, you know, the, the post-rationalization of this is that you have this sort of inherent kind of um, romantic classicism to it. We tried to get down low enough to make it feel like a, a, um, a, a Ledoux building, you know, of a stripped down class and heavy rusticated base. So I like to think that this building is the same on the other side, you know, and I'm, no one's going to tell me it's not. And unless you go to Aimless Avenue, that's taken as given. The federal style, there are points when, you know, the federal government kind of intersect, the, 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 the remit of the federal government intersect with the suburbs, and it's usually in the post boxes, you know, because the post is controlled by, by the federal government. It's not statewide. So at that point, they have to comply to this. this there's, a, there's a kind of stripped-down classicism to the federal-style architecture as well. The regulation aluminum post boxes, aluminum post boxes here. And if you photograph from the right, from the right angle, there's some, it retains a kind of sense of that austerity that you find, might suggest, in the Bibliothèque de Roy by Boulet, you know. But it's, it's in there, and it's inherent. I'm scrabbling around for a kind of connection between the federal government and the, the post-revolution. I'm not coming up with it. Country villa. So.
So, you know, we know, you know, from Stowe and so many other, so many other depictions, the picturesque landscape, you know, of a country villa, a house in the country and the grounds in the foreground. One of the many byproducts of the downturn of the American economy from 2008 onwards has been a decline in the pace of residential construction. In many cases, the newly divided suburban developments are partially completed, leaving a lacuna in the form of vacant lots between the houses. Although initially marked out and graded in optimistic anticipation of imminent transformation, the passage of time and weather has gradually erased the demarcation and merged the lots into an extensive space that recalls the common land, the central parks that typify older suburban neighborhoods. These voids are oddly, oddly similar to one of suburbia's touchstones, that is the villa set in the open countryside. In its contemporary form, this axiomatic principle has been comprised, compromised and modified by the constraints of such reduced lot sizes, tight setbacks. But the suburban home remains, at heart, a detached house. So if this development had been completed as intended, it would be a sea of front porches and picket fences, and garages and all the accoutrements of suburbia. Without them, the approaching pedestrian is able to ramble freely and approach the distant house by whatever route they wish. And I did this. I spent a long time wandering around. I imagined myself wandering around in the gardens of Stowe. I could wander in a romantic route and approach the house in whatever way I liked. The unwittingly, the vacant lots provoke the paradigmatic picturesque scenario of the Palladian villa set within the landscape. A strange connection, considering that suburbia's chief inspiration is here evoked by the failure of the suburban project. Um, again, you know, the colonial style, this is in Carolina here. Again, you know, um, the suburban development, we'll always talk about the development being completed in one go, but quite often these truncated rows here where they don't f complete the row describes the ebb and flow of the economic cycle. So you get part built. And it's that point that it, explo ex that it exposes these elevations here. What I like about this is it's, it's in the colonial style, but referring to this, you know, the colonial style where you were looking at over agriculture, sort of a cultivated foreground, you know, stubble, and then the forest, the hunting forest, and, 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 the, and the countryside beyond. Um, what I enjoy about this one is the way in which it does a sort of a 90 degree turn of that, of that tradition. So this feels like the grand vista that you would look out from, and yet it's the side view. And when all the decoration that signifies colonial is fixated with that short view across the street to the house on the other side. A rustic pile. Um, I've given this lecture in the US, and um, no matter how many times I try and describe what a rustic pile is, it just is not coming across, you know. Um, but, you know, um, we all have our own rustic pile uh, somewhere in our minds, I guess. Um, this is called rustic pile. So suburban houses in the American Southwest often feature roofs laid with concrete Spanish tile. During construction, such houses are pre-stressed by loading the tiles in even stacks across the surface of the roof. These stacks remain in place for two weeks, allowing the frame to settle and preventing any further deflection once the tiles are installed. The practice is illustrated in this photograph in which each roof appears like an informal pile of, or kind of a rough approximation of the pitched roof form that it will eventually, eventually adopt. The tiles are conventionally pigmented in somber earth tones, which match the surrounding desert environment and blend into the rocky backdrop. The hip roof appears to affirm this connection by the way that it replicates the silhouette of the mountain in the distance. So recognizing the importance of this connection between suburbia and the natural environment, Arizona developers create buildings rendered in desert shades, finished in rustic stone cladding. The pre-stressing of the structure in this manner seems an unwitting addition to the variety of ways in which buildings are deliberately associated with the landscape. Although only temporary, the appearance of these, these tile stacks offers an accidental link to the aesthetic vocabulary of the rustic desert contextualism. In reason, re regions of rapid urban expansion like Arizona, I say former rapid urban expansion like Arizona. However, the rugged informality of this roof creates the illusion of a building that is being consumed by the landscape rather than vice versa. Standard one, cast all. 
So this is something new here. Um, we look at this phrase down here, standard one car stall. This is the house in, in Casa, Casa Grande, which is between Tucson and, Arizona, Tucson and Phoenix. And it represented something quite new to me. I hadn't seen this before, but it's an emerging trend. And it's an emerging trend which entirely severs the house proper from the road. And that's, and that's signified in standard one car store, which is what they call an option. When you buy a suburban house, you buy it with options, an option room. The option room is that it could be a hobby room bedroom, or it could be a garage. Yeah. So we're confronted now with the possibility of almost the entire front elevation of a suburban house being, being made up of garages with cars. Th that, if it doesn't kind of work in plan, in the interest, it's like this. So what I'm thinking of is a very <laughs> ambiguous kind of confused, confused space. You don't know what you are in that space, right? Or what, what you're supposed to be doing because it's a garage, you know, but there's a, 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 a round window, a, you know, a pointed window, uh, an arched window, grand arched window, pitch, two smaller windows, you know, so that it conforms to the required aesthetic of the front of the suburban house, and yet it's got the garage in the side, you know, slightly apologetic, or it's only a single garage. Um, but what may, what's the, 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 the moment is this, is this here. So that you can be looking at this house, and then through that window, there's a pristine SUV, it's polished immaculately, and they clean the tires because they don't want to do under, undermine the value of the property by getting the floor dirty, because eventually, it's going to be used, it may be used as a bedroom, right? But that bedroom also has this sort of reeks of that kind of teenager, the errant teenager that you don't want. You go and stick him in the garage, you know. So, so you've got your punky, sweaty, stinking, you know, uh, teenager. In that horrible, <laughs> abysmal description. Uh, you've got your teenager, your average teenager in here. In here, and so he's in, a, he's in a garage, you know, with a roller shutter door at one, one end, but, but three nice, nice windows looking out of it. Either, which, whichever way you look at it, whether you're providing a um, highly domestic comfort environment for uh, your, your um, Lexus SUV uh, 340 hybrid, uh, or you're providing accommodation for your, your errant son, it's, it's an odd, oddly, oddly ambiguous space. Of course, the ambiguity of, of, uh, of that entrance may be, we may kind of go to the, deta the de detached house, obviously a Victorian invention, and a semi-detached house, I beg your pardon. But the trick here is to, to join both entrances together to give yourself a sense of grandeur, you know, that you live in a, in a, in a detached house. Really, it's two houses, um, a neat little trick for, um, for aspiration, aspirational occupants, I suppose. So that's fine, we all agree with that. But when we get to Arizona, we have a semi-detached house with two garages as, as the entrance here. You know? And I know in this instance, this is another example of almost that Villa Barbaro kind of thing, this splayed out plan. It has two double garages on each wing which inflect inwards. And I know that these develop, the, the, the developers of this property uh, I had a sort of long time discussing how they could reduce the effect of the garage in the sense we've got to keep it small. So it's not, it's not a garage, so it's a smaller garage. It's just a single garage. But again, you get the kind of legacy of the semi-detached house, the twin entrance, you know. But this time, it's the practical twin, en twin entrance of the, of the semi-detached double garage. Again, that issue of the, of the, of the, of the typology, the legacy and the tradition coming up against practical practical life. We're in Portland here. And of course, Portland, Portland is, is a place where the most moral Americans live. It's, uh, it's, it's not a car culture. It's uh, uh, health food orientated and everybody walks a lot and uh, they, wear, they do a lot of mountain, mountain climbing and it's, it's a, a nice place. You know, the, but they get this, you get this kind of odd kind of appropriation of the Midwestern style porch, but three century-like doors. Yeah. We all know what a, mostly know what a muse house is here. You know, I'm thinking about a future muse you know, that gets occupied later. This is a new urbanist development in, in Ankeny in Iowa. And the new urbanist, one of the new urbanist principles is that you, you enter the property, the garage is placed at the rear of the property. And these are fairly grand houses, about 3,000 square feet. But to keep, be in keeping with the house, they have to keep the ridge line high, which means that you get double garage, a single garage, and then a a, a double height space on the inside. 
30, 40, something like that, argue, arguable percentage of college graduates are now going home, returning home, what are called the boomerang generation. Because the quality of life that they're going to get in their college degree isn't going to be anything like the one that they had at home, the boomerang generation, otherwise known as the slack wazee. Uh, uh, the slack was here returning home. <laughs> you know, the, I, I go through this quite a lot of teaching in a state university in the, in the U.S. where you see parents bringing their kids in that big formal goodbye where they say goodbye to their, their kids and they send them off into the real world. They're going to college. They've got everything they need. Uh, but then they're back, like four years, four years later. And it's not what people plan. That empty nest, the empty nesters are finding that the kids are coming back and it's screwing it up for everybody. So um, I think, you know, I would imagine in places like this, the new urbanist development, that this is the new muse house here. You know, when you bear in mind, you know, it's volume in a lot of cases, a double height space. Or, you know, something like in this case, you know, this is the back of the house, this is the garage entrance, but it's going to become a teen apartment, you know, at the back of a grand suburban house. You think of the space on the inside, double height space. Uh, it looks like the setting for some strange Ald Aldwych farce, potentially. Uh, I wonder what that is. Oh, that would be worth to think about that. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, we're in uh, the, show, the, the area of the model home. Okay. Um, so in a model home, when you go to buy a suburban house, you go, you'll be taken around a hamlet of different types of house that you could buy for different price. And they are decorated in, the, in they, they, they kind of ramp up the familiarity of these places. They ramp up the domesticity of them. Everything is turned up to maximum, as domestic, as, as, as picturesque as they can possibly have. So one of the options that you get when you buy one of these houses is to have it landscaped here. And the landscaper can't just help himself in this, in this environment. And of course, um, there, you know, there it is. It's easy to laugh. <coughs> and I do sometimes. Um, this house is eventually sold and absorbed into the rest of the community. The planting will be removed and the garage restored to its rightful function. In the meantime, however, it suggests a dystopian vision of a resurgent desert landscape invading suburbia after the cars have gone. No, I think, I think that's good. We're back. We're nearly done. Um, so just to make sure that you know it's, it's not one off. There we go. I, I kind of imagine that Thunderbird style, kind of the hedge going down like that when the car, when the car comes out. Yeah. But natural ambience, ambiance, I beg your pardon, a natural am, ambiance. So when you're going around, going around these, these, these show home hamlets, um, Wherever you are, you are, I mean, thanks to Tom and his, his, his calm, Tom says things occasionally like, well, you could do it that way, you know, in the editorial process. Well, I said, Tom, I'm really thinking of doing this or calling it that. And he's never really said no. You know, he always says, well, you could do it that way. Some people might do it that way. I had a heck of a job not calling this one rock music, right? We call it natural ambi ambiance instead. So, so in walking around this hamlet of show homes, you're accompanied by music that emanates from injection-molded plastic rocks that are set within the, set within the landscape. Kind of um, light jazz, usually. But what I've noticed recently is that, is that they're going for the new age music. Right? So I got to know the people at the Blandford Estates here uh, up in Scottsdale.
Okay, so it's pretty. Uh, thanks. So it's 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 um, it's new age music. Um, what's odd about this is really the way in which um, the kind of um, a kind of diaspora of influences is assimilated into suburbia. When we started out on this on this uh, on this journey, we were we were sort of preloaded with the archetypal view of picket fence suburbia. You know, it's not like that today. It's it's extremely multicultural. That image is a, is a, is a is a sort of an archetype, really, but it doesn't really represent what you see when you get there. There's nothing that suburbia won't assimilate in order to in order to to promote itself. And in this case, you know, uh, these houses are decorated. Um, there's a lot of of kind of new aginess that's been assimilated into them. Um, so you get these punnets of, plastic punnets of wheatgrass, right, waiting to be juiced. So it's plastic wheatgrass sitting on the side waiting to be, to be juiced. Um, but it's odd that it doesn't kick out the traditional style. Um, the contemporary aesthetic has not supplanted the previous trend, but just slots in beside it with remarkable ease. Ethnic and folksy decor sit comfortably alongside the time-honored artifact of 1950s suburbia. Kitchen tables and counters are set within the traditional area air of the permanently baked apple pie and displays of quaintly rusting biscuit tins. A house sporting the Spanish style exterior will often contain a dining room decorated in wainscoting and gingham curtains. Um, in the idealized setting of the suburban model home, New Age styling is merely the latest addition to the ever-expanding range of elements appropriated to articulate the quintessential domestic interior. Today, the omnipresent sound of Enya signals the extent to which the urbanity of East Coast liberalism has been effortlessly co-opted by its perceived antithesis, that is, of suburbia. Uh, this is the kind of thing. So you have Enya, the music of Enya, or Ka R. Carlos Nakai, New Age music, and a freshly baked croissant. Uh, this guy. Former model, as in she was a former model. The former model home. Um, so at a reduced price, and at the end, of when the whole, all the houses in the development are sold, people have the opportunity to buy the show home, you know, or one of a number of show homes. And, and they get them cheap, but they also get the option, they get the option of keeping everything on the interior. And of course, everything that's in the interior is there for effect, or mostly for effect. Um, I found it interesting, so I was making a comparison between the house on the left here, which is, this is in a run of homes at the Meritage community for active living. It's a retirement community, Meritage being the hybrid of, of merit and heritage. Meritage, what's my pointer? Uh, what's my pointer? There we go. Um, so this is, a, this is a show home here, and you know that because the, the lights here, there's an office behind this, this garage here, and then on the interior, it's all set up for visitors to come and look at. But I got inside this one, and it's extraordinary how, when you're given the option uh, to retain that interior, that uh, um, the simulation of domesticity, which is really a designer's uh, simula a realtor's designer's simulation, it's interesting to know what stays and what goes. Because obviously, you're not going to keep the injection-molded plastic TV there, a widescreen TV, or the injection-molded telephone, all those things that get stolen, right? Okay. Um, but is it, is it strange that you would retain the family photograph there, right? Family, f and in one case, I found that. I found that example of of somebody, you know, a framed photograph of a fishing trip with an uncle and an aunt and some children, you know, that weren't their family. Uh, you know, it was going to it was going to be replaced, and they were definitely going to keep the frame. In the meantime, before the, the photograph comes along, this one will do. You know, that trace within these homes of, and, and it's interesting to know this is a photograph of a painting within within one of them, which is a painting of a suburban house painted in a way in which I would like to photograph it. This painting was somehow kind of the way that this where the suburbia kind of emanates itself, or propagates itself, is by Re keep reiterating the message in different, in different forms, a painting of a suburban house. Uh, and they keep the curtains here, right? Again, it's another what's wrong with this, this, 
with this photograph, you know. And I did say that they didn't keep the injection molded plastic electronics goods. Uh, but they, in one case, they do. We were going to get a laptop. And in the meantime, this laptop's there masquerading as the, th as the product that they're about to buy. So, you know, oh, back there. No. Uh, other simulated interiors is the dad's cowboy bar. Don't let to be scatological about things, you know, but in looking... What's nice about the show home is that, is that nothing works, right? No tap works, nothing like that. So I saw this on several occasions. And I, I'm afraid that I have to say to you, on one occasion, I found it used. I don't, don't wish to report that, but I do, in a way. Um, but, but moving on to... So this is... A, this is um, the way in which, again, the, the house is kind of promoted, uh, modern suburban houses are promoted, so there's no wasted space. The corridor has been dispensed with. So in Dallas here, you have this um, kind of enfilade plan here. There's no corridor. These advertise themselves as having no corridor. And the reason they have no corridor is, they have, is, is that the toilet becomes this multifunctioning room. It becomes a passageway. It becomes an on, part of the ensuite bathroom on one side. It becomes a becomes a, a toilet that serves a living room here, um, and when you go there, I've, I went for a meal. People at home, it's house, and then use the toilet here, and it's very very confusing. There are all sorts of rules that are explained to you before you go to the bathroom, the dinner table. Said, you know, ultimately you have to leave both doors unlocked. But sometimes the one on the inside is locked, and sometimes one on the outside is locked, and they find they have to go around the plan. But the kind of modernity of this, you know, of this kind of this kind of this new precedence in suburban housing is really afforded by a kind of hybrid space like this, you know. That issue of movement around the plan, we're in Ankeny, Iowa here, and this is what they call, popularly called bump outs. So the bump out, the bump out is, um, so this is the fireplace on the inside. In order to maximize circulation, they remove all the obstacles there. One thinks of the tradition the tradition of suburban houses and the import, symbolic importance of the brick hearth, right? You know, um, Philip Johnson talked about the house in New Canaan was, was a sort of an, an image of burnt out houses where only the chimney stack remains, you know. Today what happens is that chimney stack, the volume of that chimney stack and the form of that chimney stack is too irritating and they push it out, they literally push it out to the bump out on the outside. So, and what you have is this kind of reduced, again, kind of overtly blank, quasi, sort of strange uh, f familiarity to this thing, like it's going to be a porch, but could never do it. And in the short distance, the like one foot distance between the hearth they have on the inside and the flue on the outside, is that this is the legacy of that, of that, of the suburban chimney stack, let's say. That indiscriminate use of UPV siding, we're up in a, a Ames, Iowa here, and this is a church uh, I've called this broad faith, this section. Broad faith is, you have broad faith in that, that UPV siding, clapboard, white clapboard siding, and a giant lawn will signify sub suburbia, even when it's got nothing to do with suburbia. There's, you get this feeling, the more time, the more time you spend there, that, that it's absolutely indiscriminate. Absolutely indiscriminate. N there's nothing that can't be clad in UPV siding and, and given a front lawn and forced to blend in with the, with the surrounding. Um, in other cases, a transitional home, retirement community. What I enjoy about this, and this is really quite an elegant little building, is the way that the UPV siding is much smaller because it's a reduced house for, for, for people in retirement. Again, houses within houses. Again, that language, what's going on here is that the designers have understood that the house is just looks too big. You know, So they've done a kind of unwitting Unger's house within a house here, and then a big debate about where the windows go. So if you took all, that, all, that, all this off, you know, you'd left with, be left with a very squint-eyed building. You'd wonder what the spaces are like on the inside. The way they arrange those spaces on the inside is to, is to cram them all together to this mini house within, within the outer house. That issue of the window here, I mean, Venturi talks about the artifice of the, of the, of the shutters I'm fine about that, but this is the new version of it. This is a double wide, it came. This is a manufactured home, and it comes in two parts here, and it has to be in two parts with 13 foot width where it can travel down a freeway. And when it gets together, 
when it arrives at its, at its site, it will be joined again down the marriage wall here. I like the name marriage wall here. First house for people, the marriage wall here. But there is a moment, of course, when all you'll see is this, you know, that piece of, that piece of, uh, of, of the shuttering. Or um, even when it's a, you know, a row of houses, there's a sense that one house is slightly better off than the other one here, you know. The way that the drain comes down here, but disgorges itself onto the forecourt of the garage here. Yeah. But this guy gets a piece of side, a piece, a curb here to stop the wheel of his car going into the muddy patch down there. So you know, this house is slightly better off than this house by a factor of about that much at the top, yeah, just slightly better. Um, <laughs> I t do you, I generally get to a point where you kind of wonder what they were... What I like about this so much is the sort of plucky resistance that this piece of guardrail <laughs> carries out. It, it, it's a sort of a... It, it's, it doesn't understand the extent to which, you know... It, it doesn't understand the task that it's performed, but it, 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 it's, it's confident about it. It's confident about its ability to deal with whatever situation it is. But even more than that is the sort of slightly aggressive backup you get from the rainwater pipe. It's like, your mate, I've got my mate behind me, and I'm going to, like, if you've got any problem backing up cars, it's like, I've got it, don't worry, I've got it. But if you need any help, you know, I'm right here behind you, right? You know, it's like the reversing, uh, you know. Um, but what, what, it's a Friday again in the office, you know, and uh, there's a big debate about, about what to do about it. Um, the UPVs, again, the, the PVC siding but, that belongs on the edge of the house, you know, uh, but that occasionally can't help itself becoming the fence. Lot lines. This property, uh, the property line divide. This is the property line that divides suburban lots are often difficult to see, and the result is, a, is in part the consensus amongst its occupants, not to build fences or walls in between individual houses. Yeah. So when you see, uh, and this is part of what they call the Parkway tradition. Olmsted, you know, in, in Riverside in, in Chicago, invented the idea of having, not allowing the barriers to, to exist between the buildings so that all the, jo all the lawns would join together and produce this kind of continuous park that you would see running through the neighborhood, right? So it kind of co-ops the front lawn as part of the idea of a park. It's a very clever kind of double use of that, that space. What you get, of course, is this is the property line here and an understanding, a kind of understanding of a very ephemeral, almost invisible wall within suburbia. This is the most ephemeral wall that you, we found within, within, within the suburbs, the division line between two properties. Now that wall is maintained and, and understood implicitly by the two owners and it's carried out by discordant mowing schedules. Right? That's the way they do it. So you get this slight tonal difference where somebody will mow their lawn on a Saturday, the other one will do it, the, 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 the neighbor does it the next Saturday. And they retain that barrier, they know exactly where that barrier is by this kind of, you know, the slight tonal differences and the slight differences of the use of weed killer and the different type of, type of grass, but it maintains this sort of, one of the key principles of suburbia of this notion of a continuous parkway. Talk about water retention, we're back in Arizona. The Buckeye Oasis. This fragment of landscape stands in sharp contrast to the barren surrounding of the Blue Horizons development in Buckeye, Arizona. Although from this perspective it appears as a lone outbreak of vegetation, it actually forms part of a continuous strip of greenery that lines the development's primary roads and links with the neighborhood via a series of entry points and openings. At this particular point, the landscape turns inwards towards the residential zone and then halts suddenly in the face, in the face of a vast expanse of undeveloped lots. A pleasant winding promenade through the greenery abruptly terminates in the stark vista of 600 undeveloped subdivisions, extending almost as far as the eye can see. So local municipalities require landscaping like this to be in place before the houses, houses are built. But in this case, there seems to be an additional motivation behind the lavish gesture. The hostility of the terrain, combined with the as yet revenueless development, would seem to make the maintenance of such planting prohibitively expensive. 
but all the evidence points to a team of workers whose efforts echo the optimistic trajectory of the landscaping itself. Curiously, the spectacle of this planting against such a forlorn backdrop only seems to reaffirm the conviction of the project, evoking not fragility but tenacity. Elsewhere, the landscape is adjoined by baseball fields and play areas, also in prime condition and yet also largely unused. Deployed in this manner, the landscape takes on a new significance, not merely a benign backdrop, but the primary agent in establishing an establishment of suburbia, advancing across an inhospitable terrain of the Arizona desert in the unwavering affirmation of the Arcadian principles of endless suburban propagation. I will conclude. Um, when we set off on the tour, uh, it set in motion uh, an interest that stays with me today. Wherever I've lived, I've continued to visit the suburbs and build on what we've discovered. Many of the photographs we've taken are around Phoenix, uh, an American Southwest, where we choose to live and work now. Here, suburbia lies in abundance, in its latest and most audacious form, and yet frozen in a moment of doubt and stasis. Phoenix is a city like Las Vegas, where the apotheosis of the suburban experiment now hangs in the balance. Perhaps it will be proved to be its greatest achievement, or perhaps it will, mark, it will be the mark in the sand where the dream finally came to a halt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone want a question? <coughs> well, we can just hit the, um, hit the wine. Uh, I'm happy to take questions in any, in any form, but I'm only going to do it for the drink. <laughs> okay, let's just... Okay, oh, quick one, scrap. Go ahead, <laughs> I, live in a, I live in a zero lot house. Uh, I live in Scottsdale. Uh, I, I, I confess openly, but, uh, but um, uh, you, you, um, I live in a house which is a zero lot house, and I do it because it's actually a better type of design. I, I do fundamentally believe in, in a kind of, uh, uh, certainly in that part of, part of the US. Um, the reason is I'm a failed suburbanite, really, fundamentally. I tried to live in the suburbs for a while. I was renting the property, but I just couldn't keep the lawn in order. I couldn't. And it's very interesting because it's a very friendly place. People, neighbors, started doing my lawn for me and helping me. Helping, they helped me start up the mower and they showed me what to do. And I kept falling away. But, and then after a while, the veil, there's a, this sort of veiled threats. You get these veiled threats saying, nice, uh, nice savanna you're growing there. I got that a couple of times. You know, Very polite, very nice. But you seem to be growing nice savanna. So I just couldn't keep up with the, with the man's work required in order to be, to be a suburbanite. So I failed and I, I went to, um, I live in a downtown area, in a zero lot house with, with uh, patios and plants in pots where I can control them, nature. Yeah. So uh, thanks for that question. I was wondering whether somebody was gonna, going, going to ask. I, I entirely failed to be a suburbanite. <laughs> well, the um, <laughs> why is it so good for horror movies? Well, I, I mean, there, there is the the, the um, uh, I, I, I mean, I think the the um, the the sense of um, domestic perfection is kind of written into the suburban house in some in some way. You know, it's so so idealized. Um, that I think they use it, they probably use it as, as the, the strongest counterpoint to, for disaster, I, I would imagine. I'm thinking of Scream, of course, or Scream 2, you know, but you persistently see, there's that, there's that description of, of glass, isn't there, transparency in glass and suburban windows, where, you know, at night the window becomes black, opaque black, and of course you're always looking, you're always, you have your face right up against the window before the masked man kind of, kind of, kind of appears. Why is it so good for horror movies? You obviously know the answer. To this. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, Jason, I'm guessing uh, you and Alex have obviously been in the past. We didn't break in. We didn't break in. 
No, no, we didn't. Um, and we wandered around them. And what happened was because we approached we approached them uh, as a seem apparently pleasant people. You know, uh, we don't have any problem being invited in. In fact, people open their doors to us, and I'm, you know, um, as a, I'm, I'm really, I'm indebted to so many people in this, in this case. And as I say, it kind of confused my, my preconceptions of suburbia being in a place of exclusivity. Um, on numerous occasions, we were invited into the house when we were even asked. On several occasions, we were given meals, and on one occasion, we stayed the night. Yeah, and just invited us in and put us up for the night in this, this environment. So on no occasion, we never had any problem, any one, one point at all. What I did find was that seeing houses, houses that were in a part built, were part built and they were just finishing it, then you could go in and really see what the house was like in its pristine condition. There'd be some guy fixing the carpet, putting in the electrics or something, something like that, and they didn't give a damn, really. So you could just, we just got into the habit of just walking in, and people would think we were looking at the property and buying it. I have to say, I have a whole repertoire of different excuses as to why I'm there, you know, which starts from, you know, there's different shades of the truth, really, which with the genuine one is that I'm an architect interested in suburbia, but in some cases, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting a job and I want to live in a house. I'm going to get a job in a local architecture school and I'm thinking of buying, you know, to when I'm going to the retirement communities, you know, um, I'm an architect, uh, now I'm interested in buying a house for my mother, who's coming over from England, you know, and all the other gambit, all the other things, so dress appropriately. I think on several occasions people rumbled me and they knew that I wasn't, I wasn't there saying what I was doing. But it, what is so amazing is that they stay on point. They just continue the sales, sales pattern, you know, which is very impressive. You said, here's a guy, don't know what he's doing, he's up to something, but still we might be able to sell him a house, you know. And it's really impressive. It's just rhetorical, you know. Uh, I haven't bought into it yet. <laughs> Let's have a wine. Thanks. Let's have a wine. Thank you very much. Thank you.